There we are. Hey. How you doing, hey. man? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm tired. I've been streaming for a while. We were watching some uh, degenerate alcoholic content, but it's funny. I don't know what you think about, like, Steve will do it and all that. Oh, yeah. I've never been a huge fan of that kind of stuff. Are you, you're real into, uh, that? he's with the Nelk guys, right? Yeah, I've been hanging out with them a little bit. They're, they're in the area, and plus they're a fellow Rumbler, so I'm going to support people on, on this new platform. And I didn't know you stream on Rumble, too. Yeah, yeah, I started multi-streaming on Rumble, uh, you know, just because you want to get as much crossover. Obviously, this is my main platform. But yeah, I saw, so it was today or uh, yesterday, was that your first stream on Rumble? Yesterday was my first stream, today's day two, and I'm just going strong. I've been streaming for four and a half hours. I'm going to keep on trying to run it up on this free speech platform. I thought you were banned on here. I just assumed that you were banned on everything except for Cozy. No, yeah, I mean, so the thing with Rumble and with some of these other platforms is, they do have a terms of service. You know, Trump got signed on to Rumble, I think, at the beginning of this year or maybe sometime last year. And for him to come on the platform, they forced them to adopt this, like, big TOS. And they haven't banned me yet, but it includes all the things that Twitter includes, that Instagram includes. And so out of an abundance of caution, it's like, well, I don't want to take the same chance with an alt platform as with the mainstream platform with the you know, the hate speech terms of service, that, that aspect of it. So, um, so I'm kind of one foot in and one foot out. I really wanted to do a podcast. I was thinking about people that I could do a Spotify podcast with. And I was thinking, yo, it would have been great. And Chad, I texted Nick yesterday. I'm like, let's do a Spotify podcast. Like, oh, how did you get banned? I thought that was a, a free speech platform. How did you get banned on Spotify? They, uh, so, you know, they were calling on Spotify to ban Ye and take all his music off. And they came on and said, well, we really can't ban his music because his music isn't hateful. And they said, we can only ban hateful, hateful content. So like podcasts about politics, about, you know, so-called white supremacy or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just, yeah, I'm banned on everything, man. <laughs> you see, you see the treatment they're giving to people. Um, well, how about you? Are you have you been banned for anything else since YouTube and, and everything back in YouTube, the summer? YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, TikTok. I'm still good on Instagram, good on Rumble, and good on Spotify. But I, yesterday I watched uh, someone made a documentary called The Devastating Demise of Sneeko, um, a leftist yeah. with he, him. And it was that was a big hit to my career for first talking to you. Even then, like they were talking about how um, – you're using me to spread your anti-Semitic white supremacy, how I went down the alt-right pipeline and how I'm laughing along with a, a white supremacist and all that. Um, but he was even mentioning, did, did you go to the Charleston uh, Nazi rally? I, I didn't think you went there, did you? To Charlottesville, yeah, I went to Charlottesville. Oh, Charlottesville, what was that about? So that's sort of a long story because, and I'll, I'll try and keep it short, but... Um, so that, that was the first year that I did my show. I started my show February 2017, and that was August 2017. And, you know, the way that it was advertised at the time was that it was anti-immigration. It was about the Robert E. Lee Monument. They were going to rename the Robert E. Lee Park and the Robert E. Lee Monument uh, in Charlottesville around the University of Virginia. And so I thought that it was going to be like a mainstream event. I was told that Faith Goldie was going to be there, and she used to work for The Rebel. The Rebel is like this Jewish publication in Canada. They were very, like, soft. Gavin McGinnis was, I thought, was going. I was told Sam Hyde was going. Um, <clears throat> so I was under the impression, because they called it Unite the Right. I was under the impression, like, all the right-wing people are going to be there. And then I went there and, uh, well, not all those people were there. Faith Goldie was there, but then she got fired for being there. And some people never showed up. Um, so, you know, I was never on board with the, you know, Richard Spencer and Mike Enoch. I was never really with that crowd, but I wound up there, um, you know, protesting immigration. Why? What are your thoughts on that? Are you, <laughs> do, you do you think differently of me because you know that, that I was at Charlottesville? Uh, it depends on how much you supported it and how much, like, you if you if you didn't know what it was gonna be about were you there burning swastikas and like with the flags and shit no no the um so there were two main events the friday that was the night before they did the tiki torch thing and that's where they said you know jews will not replace yeah, us that. and i wasn't even in the city i flew in the saturday morning uh the following morning for the big rally which was at lee park i didn't even get to it i literally I, I could probably find my old plane tickets. I should probably do that at some point because I've been telling this story for years. 
I probably flew to Charlottesville. I think I got in at like 10.30 a.m., got to my hotel at 11. By the time I, got, I left my hotel, they had dispersed the main rally. So I was, I was there for probably like two or three hours, just sort of like looking for what was going on. The riot police had already shut off the all access to Lee Park. Um, and so I met up with a few people that I knew at the time, uh, James also, Brittany Fenty I saw there and uh, some other people. And then I just went back to my hotel and I flew out the next morning and that was that. And, you know, since then people have accused me of being like a Nazi because I was there. Well, I was really barely even there. And, and again, I was there because it was anti-immigration and supporting the Robert E. Lee monument, the renaming of the park and the toppling of the statue. So you're a fan of Robert E. Lee? Um, well, I'm a northerner, so Robert E. Lee doesn't mean very much to me. You know, Robert E. Lee really means more to southerners, but, um, and, and I do like Robert E. Lee for what it's worth, but it's, it's not like I'm a fanboy or something. Uh, but I am against the destruction of all these monuments. I'm against the renaming of the, the parks and the buildings and the military bases. What do you feel about all that? I think it's a part of history and... But I, I'm definitely not a fan of the Confederacy, but I, I don't think that they should get rid of history. But also celebrating these people who are probably for slavery is not the best idea. No. Lee, he, he in particular is a sort of remarkable figure because he, he said that he agreed with the cause of the North, but he fought for the South because that was his home. You know, that was what he considered to be his nation. He felt an affinity for, I think he was from, what, Virginia? Again, I'm, I'm not even really uh, a Civil War history buff or anything, but, you know, but the, there are attributes about Robert E. Lee besides the, the necessarily the particularity of the time or his side that was admirable. He was a brilliant general. He was courageous. He was patriotic uh, for his side, you know, for, for the South. And so, and I'm not even a Southerner, but I still respect it. So, um, are you of afraid course, of this type of stuff? Because you, you've been at a lot of the biggest protests and the biggest gatherings that most of the mainstream is against. So do you think about the long-term consequences of this stuff? Because if you're truly America first, isn't it better to not associate with these types of events? Like what? Like Charlottesville and, and what else? And January 6th, I, obviously you didn't know that it was going to end up like that, but Charlottesville especially. Well, with Charlottesville, again, it was about, uh, as far as I was concerned, it was about a few things, which was anti-immigration, and it was about, it was against this, this tide to remove all the statues. And if you see, it's, you look at where this thing is going, I, I, would, I would probably say, do we have to defend necessarily every single one? In a vacuum, maybe not. But... As always, them going after these particular, oh, this Confederate general or Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, where exactly do you draw the line as to who is necessarily the most defensible? I don't know. But then they go for George Washington the next day. Then they go for Thomas Jefferson. Right, that, that's for... a different story. I think people who are supporting the Confederacy, I can understand them getting rid of that statue. That makes sense to me because of the direction of the country and being anti-slavery. That makes sense. The Founding Fathers, I don't think you could put in the same category as people who wanted to secede from the nation. If you're America first, why are you in support of people who are literally anti-America? They're trying to leave the country. Because it's part of our heritage as a country. It's part of our heritage as a nation. And, and there's something about respecting the nation. You know, because I got here, my family got here four or five generations ago. My family got here after the Civil War. And so to me, because I see what you're saying, and I get it. It's not like I'm, I'm not hearing you. But, you know, my family got here after the initial colonies were established in the 17th century after the founding after the civil war which was the deadliest war in american history what is it for me who again ancestors got here all of after all that to say actually america's not about that like these confederates aren't real americans the confederates were on the american continent for hundreds of years the southerners were there for hundreds of years we may not agree with the cause or the flag, and, and obviously time has passed, and it's somewhat anachronistic, but it's still part of the nation's history, and those people, their ancestors and their descendants are still part of the fabric of the nation, and I get what you're saying, like, it's not the Confederacy, but to sort of say, oh, well, you know, they were a bunch of rebels or something, 
it sort of erases. Well, they uh, were very. They were. They literally were rebelling against the country. Well, but you have to ask yourself, what is the country? They were rebelling against the central government, which they saw as dominated by the North and by industry and by manufacturing, as against the agriculture. I'm not in favor of the cause of the Confederacy, not not in terms of slavery by itself or in terms of some of these other arguments about states' rights or whatever. I'm through and through support Lincoln and, uh, and how he centralized the federal government. Um, but by the same token... To say that they weren't part of America, you know, Georgia was one of the initial colonies. Slavery was baked into the Constitution. Again, not to say that it's okay, but to say that, you know, because they took arms against the federal government, that that means that they're anti-American. Um, is it anti-American that Donald Trump didn't accept the results of the election? Is it anti-American that, um, you know, people have protested things over time, that people say they have a right to bear arms in the event that the government becomes tyrannical. I, I don't think their political stance about the government has anything to do with your American. If you're American, you're those are people that fought and fought alongside Washington and fought in the uh, war for independence. Some of them fought the Indians way before that. Um, you know, and then they did take up arms against the government. I don't. I don't think that makes them anti-American. Is that a, is that erasing a a history, war. or is that just not honoring? Because having a statue of people who wanted to secede from the country is actively honoring people who were against the ideas that the country still represents right now. It's there's there's a difference between celebrating these people and erasing history. That's a statue I can understand removing. Do you think that? What do you think about the Confederate flag? I I don't think anybody should wave the Confederate flag, and it's. Ironic to me that the people in the South that are very like pro-America wave a flag that's literally anti-American. Um, I I support it, and again, I you don't support the Confederate it. flag. Yeah, totally. As a Northerner, and, yeah, <laughs> that, but and the, I, the flag represents slavery. I don't think it does necessarily represent. That's not what it represents to the people in the South. I don't think that people in the South or, or elsewhere. Because now you have people, you have conservative, like, country-type people fly it everywhere, in the North, in the West. It's not just a Southern thing. But that's the whole it reason represents... that they wanted to secede from the country. What slavery was the biggest issue that made them want to secede. Well, the antagonism about slavery was really about, it was really about what kind of government we had and, and, and to what extent the federal government had a right to overrule uh, the law's with that are passed by the states you know i mean slavery happened to be the substance of it but D fundamentally exactly it isn't, about... isn't that that's that's enough for me to be like no that if the, if the flag the substance is based on slavery no that flag should not be waved i just think that a, a lot of these arguments are sort of subversive I, I think that for the most part because you know you said earlier it's you have to draw the line between the confederates and the founding fathers well the founding fathers owned slaves so would you say that the Founding Fathers owned slaves? That's morally reprehensible. America fought a war to end slavery. So we need to topple the monuments of all the slave owners? No, that's not what I'm saying. Because the basis of the American flag, is it represents freedom and the basis of America. The Confederate flag is based around slavery specifically. That's the leading issue for wanting to secede from the country. The Confederate flag, can you not say represents slavery? I don't think it does. No, I and I don't think that people that fly it today do that in support of slavery. I don't and and uh, you know and I I'm with you because I'm not believe me I'm not like pro Confederate or anything like that. I'm a Northerner. I don't I'm not culturally I don't relate to the South at all. I don't own a Confederate battle flag. I would never fly that. It's not part of my culture. It's not part of my political sort of culture. Um, but I think that, and I'm speaking on behalf of people that do, who are not just in the South, I think they fly that as a symbol of rebellion against the elite, against the central government, against Washington. It's more about rebellion. And in the same way that, that George Washington owning slaves doesn't discredit his entire legacy and his status as an American, so too does necessarily the business of slavery totally poison the cause of the Confederacy or the battle flag or these particular generals. You could say Robert E. Lee was a great man, even if you fought for a cause that maybe necessarily you don't agree with. And the same is true of the flag. Maybe the flag can represent other things. And it means actually a lot even to black people who fought on the side of the Confederacy in the Civil War. 
Should people be so, allowed to fly the Nazi flag? Should they be allowed to? Yes. Yeah, that's protected by the First Amendment. Okay, but in Germany, they it, it's illegal. And it's pretty understandable why, because it represents... I think it's pretty comparable to the Confederate flag. I guess I understand it's... But do you support people, like, waving the, the Nazi flag? Are you... What do you think about that? Uh, no, I don't, I don't support people waving the Nazi flag, but... but why, why, why do you draw... Why do you support the Confederate flag, but not the Nazi flag? Because the Nazi flag isn't from our country, you know? And the Nazi flag represents something that's particularly German. If you look at National Socialism... National Socialism is a, is a very specifically German philosophy. It's altogether separate from the other kinds of fascism on the continent at the time. Um, and so for us to fly that here, it'd be like, it's like when these tankies are flying a, uh, a communist flag, like a hammer and sickle flag. I don't think it'd be appropriate to fly that here either. Um, or even a Russian flag. I make a joke sometimes out of flying a Russian flag, but I would never do a rally and have Russian flags flying because it's foreign, it's not from here. The Confederacy is is part of uh, American history, and the people that fought for the Confederacy, that was important to them, it was important to their ancestors, it was, it's important to their descendants, and they're part of the country too. And, and, and put another way, in Russia, they don't apologize for the legacy of Stalin. They don't apologize for the legacy of communism. I like that about Russia. They all recognize that Stalin was brutal, and that communism was bad, and that it killed lots of people, and it was horrible, but they're also not going to sort of attack themselves and their own history and say, oh, we're so sorry, that was the worst thing ever. They choose to focus on the good aspects of their history and the bad things they're, they're acutely aware of, but they're not going to allow that into the consciousness and poison their own identity. And I feel like Germany, it would probably be better if they did something similar to that because in Germany, they're committing suicide as a country because of guilt over the Nazis. America is committing suicide as a nation because of guilt over slavery. So many of these things, How? We, we're not I, I, allowed. I, I, I don't understand that statement. How are they committing suicide because of guilt over slavery? Because if you look at these, if you look at Germany or if you look at the United States, we are making bad decisions. Like, like for example, crime right now is out of control. Crime is surging in every major city. Uh, carjackings are surging in every major but, city. What does that have to do Tops, with the Confederate flag? Here's what it has to do with it. Because two years ago, during BLM, you had all these people out there protesting and saying George Floyd had a knee on his neck because the cops are the new KKK and it's an extension of slavery. And so because we were trying to placate people and because we were trying to appease or ameliorate our bad history, we decided that we were going to not have law and order. We decided that we were going to not have the backs of the police. And now it has this terrible outcome and we're all supposed to live with that because we feel bad about bad things that our ancestors did or other people's ancestors did 150 years ago. And so as a country, it's very poisonous to have this constant refrain about our original sin, our country was never perfect, our country was not good. It's it's something that's very damaging to this American consciousness. Right. That was um, a good way to overlook the police. But how does that affect Germany? How is Germany committing suicide? That's a that's a situation where I can understand why they ban that flag and why they try to ban that ideology after what happened. Because now they they've gone too far. And now any German that is too right wing, any German that says like we should kick refugees out, they they had during the Syrian refugee crisis yeah, like they had millions an of people of immigration, coming. Right, yeah. Yeah, and and you couldn't be against it because you were then perceived as, as xenophobic, which was like the Nazis. And so it it's like you know, countries have like an immune response. They, I ha there is a healthy amount of xenophobia because a country is your home and a country is the people that are similar and like you. And so when people that are not like you come in, they could start messing up your stuff. And so there's a healthy immune response that says, whoa, whoa, you know, this isn't a Muslim country. This isn't, this isn't Syria. This isn't Afghanistan. This is Germany. But if you've got this poison pill that says, well, we are fundamentally flawed. Well, we, we are terrible people. We have this guilt. We have this national guilt it sort of it it compromises that immune system and basically then international elements migrants corporations banks can come in and, and basically just have their way with you 
Because then anybody that says, we're a nation, we want to assert our identity, we want to assert our interests, they say, whoa, well, remember slavery, remember the Hitler, remember Stalin, remember... that. That's always how they browbeat a nation into submission. So. Then how do you combat things like racism, very clear racism, because whether, I don't know what you're going to say about that, but slavery, how do you combat those ideas without fully going off of, without fully embracing the guilt? How do you balance that? Because after the Civil War, you need to completely change the philosophy of the country. You need to change the way that black people are viewed as property. How do you balance that? And then not have this guilt that fucks up immigration. Because you're completely on the side of, oh, this guilt fucks up the police. But, bro, you can't have black people being treated like property. You need a balance. What's that balance look like to you? Which I think is important because if you're going to go into the future of politics, you're only looking at the country as a whole and immigration and all these topics, but you're excluding a big portion of the population. Which is who, black people? Yeah. Well, I, I would say that it depends on the context. I, I would probably be more in agreement with you and, and Catholics historically were 150 years ago when there was, when there were attitudes that were very negative towards black people in the country. But I would say now, that's fundamentally different. I don't think there is um, a very substantial racist element in America anymore. And if there is, I think it's very marginal and I think it's blown out of proportion. And I say on my show, I make it a point to distinguish what I'm in favor of and what I'm against. And here's, here's what I'm in favor of. I think that everybody should be treated, and I said this at my speech at AFPAC too, which is our big conference. I said every person, regardless of their race, should be treated with respect, dignity, equal rights. Um, and, and what I'm against is cruelty, prejudice, discrimination. I would never say, oh, you're black. I'm going to treat you differently. You're black. I'm going to discriminate against you. I'm going to be mean to you. I think differently about you. But we've got to get specific because what they say is you're racist. And what does racist mean? If you ask 50 people, you're going to get 50 different answers. Some people say that if you have too many white people in a given room, that's racist, which means negative towards minorities. Some people say that it's impossible to be racist against white people because a racism system of oppression. Entails, yeah, all that bullshit. Right. Yeah. So that's why you got to be specific and say, well, what do you mean by that? If you, if you mean that you're talking about someone being treated unfairly because of their, who they are, I'm totally against that. I'm totally unequivocally against that. It's, it's contradictory to Catholicism specifically and Christianity broadly. Um, but as far as we need to start tearing down monuments and we're going to change the names of parks. In some cases by mobs. In some cases, the government doesn't even do it. Like during 2020, it was just people getting in the city and just knocking it down and throwing it in the river. We can't have a country that's run by mob rule like that. Um, and, and certainly I don't think that what, who should have a statue should be dictated by the passions of a mob that are clearly not reciprocating those feelings. So what do you think you know? black people should think about living in a city that has a Robert E. Lee statue? Do you think from that perspective? Yeah, and again, I, I understand that in terms of somebody like Robert E. Lee or Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, I think that's a better example because Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, who was in the Ku Klux Klan, he's another one that they try to defend the statue. And that one, I don't know. It's like there's a gray area. How, what do you how, think? What how do you does think? it make people feel? That statue um, should be taken down, in my opinion. That should not be up. We should not celebrate these. A statue is celebrating these people. I would say that it's it's tricky because, and I say that as somebody who, listen, I'm not, it's not like I'm somebody that would be totally welcome in that era. I'm, I'm Italian and Irish and Catholic. So how's it the tricky? The Ku Klux Klan hated all those people. It's tricky because once you start that process again, if you say, well, you're in the Ku Klux Klan, so obviously your statue's got to go. Well, you fought for the Confederacy, so obviously your statue's got to go. Well, George Washington owned slaves. Are we really going to say, well, you know, you fought for the side that owned slaves and you own people? And you're going to say that owning people is so much better than not owning people, but fighting to own people, you know? And so it's, the problem is it completely pulls the rug out from under our whole history because unfortunately the world is built on, on slavery, genocide, war. Right. No, There's a no difference people. between, there's a difference between erasing history and then honoring 
the wrong people. See, where I think it can differentiate is in the school that I went to. They had a Thomas Jefferson statue in front of the school. And then all the, the liberals had a big protest to take it down because he owned slaves. But his principles were freedom of speech and were freedom. So yes, he owned slaves, but you got to look at what his core philosophies were. The core philosophies of a Ku Klux Klan member are based in hatred. So if we don't support that and we don't celebrate that, then it should be taken down. Was Thomas Jefferson's core philosophies pro-slavery? No, it was freedom of speech. So we can keep that up. Well, but see, Thomas Jefferson, although you're right, I you know, you should read some of the things he had to say about slavery. None of the founding fathers believed that blacks and whites should live together in America on an equal no, basis. No, I know that. I know that. And even some of my favorite people like Malcolm X, I really look up to, he, he thought the same things, that they shouldn't live together. But the core, well, their, their core principles weren't based in that. It was the it was, though. It was, though. They, they did not believe. Washington and Jefferson and even Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln said, if I could win the Civil War without freeing a single slave, I would do that. You know, so is Abraham Lincoln's core principle about uh, having political equality for, for black people, or was it about holding the union together under a strong central government? I'm just trying to challenge maybe your preconceived notions about these people. The point is that the past is filled with sins. The past is filled with um, with these kinds of attitudes, and um, and you could go back to the Bible, and you'll find people slaughtering other nations and slaughtering other villages and That's again, true. where do you draw the line? That's true. But shouldn't you also consider how people I, uh, idolize these people today? If you keep a KKK statue up, what does that do today? That gives people an idol to look at who support the KKK. If you look at the idea of how Abraham Lincoln is represented today, now I'm seeing how that's erasing history because, yeah, maybe people misrepresent Abraham Lincoln if he, was, if he didn't even care about slavery in the first place. But... You got you to gotta realize that most people are not going to look at history correctly. They have a different represent, representation today, and maybe that's more important to look at how the normies are going to look at these people rather than what they represented at that time. If people think that Abraham Lincoln was pro-freedom of the slaves, then maybe we should let that go. Maybe the preservation of history is not as important as you're making it out to be because just if you're being realistic, most people are not going to look back at it correctly. History is always changing. History is always written by the victor. But and, and here's the thing, though, is I'm not a Southerner and I'm, I don't have any particular affinity for Robert E. Lee or for not a part. I have a general affinity because I think that he's a great general. So he's he has admirable traits in that way. But for the people of the South, it means a lot to them. And, and if you look at the history of the Reconstruction, a lot of these towns in the South, they cobbled together what meager resources they had. Their entire nation was destroyed. Their their land was destroyed. Like the war happened in the South, not in the North. So all their wealth was destroyed. And then they were occupied militarily by the North for decades and by carpetbaggers. And so a lot of these cities, they would cobble together their meager resources and build statues commemorating their brothers, commemorating their fallen, their, their heroes, their civic leaders, their ancestors. And so that, that is part of their identity. It's part of the fabric of who they are and what it means to be a Southerner or an American to them. And, and the point is, like, you, you can't find anybody before the year 2000 that, that isn't extremely problematic. You know, you could, you could point a finger at any monument, Martin Luther King Jr. or Lincoln or Washington or Jefferson, and the same standards that you're applying to Nathan Bedford Forrest or Robert E. Lee, they're somewhat arbitrary because you could point the finger and say equally terrible things about Columbus, about Washington, about whoever. And so the question is, are we going to look at Columbus and Washington and others and say, are they a product of their time? Are they, you know, part of history? And we recognize that they're, you know, as, as everybody is, they're men in time. And we're going to recognize their role in our history and their role in the fabric of our country. Or are we going to have this totalizing view of if you don't have the morality of the United Nations after 1991, then you're reprehensible, you're a rebel, you're evil. Because we'd be taking down a lot of statues and renaming a lot of stuff. And you'd have to go way, way back. Muslims couldn't be proud of anybody. Christians couldn't be proud of anybody. Black people couldn't be proud of anybody. White people couldn't be proud of anybody. Because the, the, the world history is a story of murder and war and slavery and... And again, if you point to me and say, 
here's a group that's killing people or doing horrible things today, I'd be the first to go out and say that's, that's no good and that needs to go. But taking down these statues, they won't tell you that they want them all to go. They start with Nathan Bedford Forrest, and what they don't tell you is they hate all of Western civilization. They want Columbus to go. They want Washington to go. They want it all to go. And who do they want to build statues of? Pedophiles, Marxists, freaks. They're their own problematic people. So, you know, that that's where it's not just Maybe, about having a museum. My point is that if you want to be successful in politics, part of the truth needs to be compromised. That's an uncomfortable reality. And you see how being as truthful as you are, you see like the restriction that you have. So you're the most canceled person. Like you're on a no fly list, everything like that. If you don't compromise some of these beliefs, you just will never be successful in politics. You have to, you, some of these statues just need to be removed so that you can compromise for the normies and so that you can make people feel better. I know that you want to go completely down the truth and you, you don't want to compromise history and some of these people, everybody represents these bad things, but in order to be successful and in order to win the popular vote, it, it's, it's just never going to work. Well, uh, you know, people have told me that a lot about the practicality of it. And for right now, I'm, I see myself as sort of the second or the third wave here of people that have been trying to set the country on the right course for a long time. And right now, people just need to know the truth. People just need to wake up. And I, I am less interested they in... They won't. They won't. Uh, well, the vast majority of people won't. So it, you need to wrap up the red pill and seven layers of ham to feed it to the vast... There, there's so many people in this country. There's so many different races. It's just never going to work like that. Think about how many people you're alienating by fully sticking to this. Just some things you can't do. It's just not going to work. And I understand that you don't want to compromise. I, I relate to you on that level, but you just have to. And it, it's the mistakes that we've both made, and that's why we're ending up on these alternative platforms. Can't, uh. can't you admit that... If we had compromised a little bit more and if we had watered it down for the vast majority of people, then what's more important would end up in the minds of people. We could stick to what's really important and how you, I could really reach the level of people that I wanted to reach. And you could probably reach the level of, in politics that you wanted to reach if you had compromised some of these uncomfortable truths. No, and, and I think that's a very dangerous conceit because here's the thing. If, if you're... What, what is going on right now is not passive, it's active. America is being ruined. We have an elite that hates us, and we have an elite that is wrecking the country because they are, they're they're putting their own best interest at the expense of the interest of the country. They're doing what's good for them, not what's good for America. They're corrupt. And so, it, it to me, it's a very dangerous idea that um, if we just played nice, and if we just, like you said, compromised and softened the truth. Not and play nice and completely, the but just a little bit. A little, well, I, I don't regret anything that I did to get canceled and end up on Rumble, but it would have been better for the truth if I had maybe streamed some of it on YouTube and then some of the other stuff on a different platform because ultimately having access to everybody is more valuable than being fully truthful. That's, that's part of the uncomfortable truth is that not everybody is ready to hear it. Not everybody is going to, and you need to compromise a little bit to be successful and to, to reach everybody that you could reach. Because now think about how many people, every time somebody makes a documentary about me, they bring up how you're a Nazi, they bring up how you're a white supremacist, and then immediately a lot of people that would relate to you or could hear your message are alienated because they hear these words and they're turned off. And a lot of people are just not ready to hear the truth. And the, the amount of power that all the, the Matrix platforms and the amount of brainwashing that people are hearing, it's just you can't fight against that without compromising a little bit. It's unfortunately, it's unavoidable. I, I agree with you that you got to be strategic. I agree with you that you got to be tactful and you got to have a concern about logistics and things like that. But, and this is what I was trying to get at, you're going against the system. The system is going to punish you. It's unavoidable that if you're, if you're telling the truth in any capacity, they're going to try and strip that from you. Your access to the platforms, your access to the the money your access to people is contingent on you not being a threat to the system look at yay look at trump look at andrew tate look at alex jones look at you look at me look at bannon there there's 
the only way, and increasingly it's like this, the only way that you're going to be able to have access to these things is if you explicitly submit and bend the knee and say, I surrender to Zog, I surrender to Moloch, you know, I'm not, I am not a Groiper, I am not an anti-Semite, I am not those things. And at a certain point, there's this time for choosing where you got to say the pain box, the, the social backlash, the whatever that comes with confronting the system, it's baked into the cake. It's our job to, well, maybe not so much you, because, and here's the thing, I always said this about you and Tate, this, this isn't really your job I, in the sense that you, I don't think you see yourself as a political actor. I think you see no. yourself as an entertainer and to some extent a truth teller. I mean, I'm a political guy. Yeah. And insofar as I'm a political guy, it's a political problem that we've got to push through censorship and media control and all these kinds of things. And, um, and if it were so simple as just being tactful and just kind of playing it close to the chest, well, people have been doing that for a long time. But we've got to be bold and tell the truth, and and there are going to be there is going to be misunderstanding, and there are going to be consequences. But it's our job to push past that, you know, because you get the most flack when you're flying over the target. We can't stop flying over the target because we get flack. And I understand from your perspective, and I told you this when when you got banned on YouTube, what did I say? I said don't have me on on your show. I said you keep your platforms. I said you go on Twitch and you just play it as safe as possible because you. Right? I mean, I didn't I got banned on Twitch for doing nothing. I got banned on Twitch for eating a salad. Part of the part of the compromise and I, I realized this today cuz my first stream on Rumble, I was saying faggot. I said faggot maybe like 50 times. Faggot, 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 faggot. And then I started thinking about the long term. So, what's more beneficial is having more people on Rumble, having more of the normies trickle into here and wrapping it a little bit of ham. And my chat started saying faggot, faggot. I'm telling him like it's it's better to not say this word. So that more people, because like, think about how many people are just going to be alienated by that. Think about how many people are just not. So it, it, that's a compromise. That's the same compromise I could see in some of the statues. Like maybe, yes, it's not. It's just a word. It doesn't mean that much. It, it's, it doesn't mean I'm homophobic. It's just a fun word to say. But you got to think long term. And if I want more people to come to Rumble, if I want to reach more people, it's like, okay, do I have to say this word? That's the same thing as taking down a KKK statue. Well, the, the problem is that the people that want to take down the KKK statue, I guarantee that the majority of people that want to see that statue go, they also want to see Robert E. Lee go, and I'm sure they want to see Columbus go, and, and probably half of them want to see Jefferson go. So it's like there's this conceit in politics where you make compromises to try to win over people that fundamentally disagree with you and never will agree with you. And in doing so, you sacrifice all the people who do agree with you. Because I guarantee you that all the people that mostly agree with me support the monuments being up. And all the people that fundamentally disagree with me want the statue to come down. So should I go out there in an effort to appeal to people that think America was founded by slave owners and there's a poison pill from the very beginning? Should I make a compromise to win them over, which I never will, and in the process lose the support of the people that do agree with me? People that say, oh, I can't believe you'd sell out American history, blah, blah, blah. So, and, and I'm not trying to shut you down because I agree with you. Like, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be thoughtful about your approach. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, um, you know, understand who your audience is and talk to a particular audience. And yeah. So sometimes it, you can make a joke and sometimes it's not the time to say faggot or zog or whatever. You know, there's a time and place for everything. But I would only call, I'm just giving you a little devil's advocate here. I would only push back and say, that's a very conventional political wisdom. And what I found since I started this show is that uh, it's really, it works in a counterintuitive way. That's how Republicans have always thought is like, let's bend over backwards to win over these black voters. And they never win them over. And in the process, they just lose their white voters, which are dutifully ready to show up and cast their vote. And it's like, and that's just how it happens to break down for Republicans in particular. And it's like, that's not to say that we shouldn't have a party that black people can be a part of, but it is to say, why are we creating a platinum plan and the First Step Act if blacks aren't really even going to vote for us? And in the process, we lose all the white people that voted for law and order, you know? So it's, it's, that's why I say it's tricky. That's why I say it's not as simple Why can't as... you apply that same logic? If you were telling me before I got uh, my Twitch ban, you were saying, don't have me on, play it safe. Why can't you apply that exact same logic to your political approach? Because I think we're trying to do, we're trying to do two different things. You know, um, because me, I, my whole life was always sort of set up to be this way in a, in a certain sense. I'm antisocial. I'm a... Uh, 
eccentric person. I I'm an antagonist. That's my personality. And what I set out to do from the beginning was to be provocative. Um, and I knew this was coming. I knew this was coming from day one. And I knew that I could survive it and handle it and live with it. And I think that you're somebody who, um, you know, you're more mainstream. You're more of a cultural figure. And to somebody like you, does it make sense? Is it the hill to die on that you want to defend little old me, you know, or, or a particular view? It's a question of what probably you're trying not. to accomplish. Yeah, probably not. So, yeah. So. Yeah, it was good to talk to you, though. I, I've been streaming for five hours. I'm tired as hell. Uh, shout out to Cozy. Thanks for this conversation. I think this is good. We, we should get more discussions like that. Just don't be on uh, Black People Time next time. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Hey, that's racist. You got to watch your approach. <laughs> Shut the fuck all right, man. I'll tease you. Please. All right. Good talking to you, man. See ya. That's it's it. It's your job.